We've already discussed how a neuron can generate and propagate an action potential to send a message. But what happens when that message reaches a destination? How does a neuron talk to another neuron, a gland, or a muscle? Let's look at this picture and let's see what happens. These two neurons aren't physically touching. If we look at this space right here and zoom in right here to where these two neurons are communicating, let's see what happens. There's a gap there, a physical gap called the synapse or the synaptic cleft. Any cell-to-cell -cell communication requires the transfer and reception of chemicals. For a neuron, this means that our electrical event, the action potential, must be converted into a chemical event. As the action potential reaches the terminus, it's moving down the axon, reaching the terminus, and we zoom in here, special channels open that let calcium ions flow into the neuron. The influx of these calcium ions stimulates the cell to release vesicles filled with shape-specific molecules into the synapse. These chemicals are called neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters are shape-specific molecules that bind to receptors on the postsynaptic side. These, these are protein receptors in the membrane of the neighboring cell. We see them here and here and here. Neurotransmitters are classified as either excitatory or inhibitory. If they are excitatory, then they will stimulate the next cell, bringing it closer to threshold potential and possibly initiating a new action potential. If it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, it will take the neuron away from threshold, making it less likely to fire. Let's take a look at this animation. Here's the terminus of one axon, and here's the postsynaptic side, the receiving side over here. And if I start the active potential, we see vesicles releasing neurotransmitters into the synapse. They're binding to shape-specific receptors on the postsynaptic side. And in this case, being excitatory, they're going to open up channels to allow sodium to come in. This influx of sodium may trigger a new active potential on this postsynaptic side. Let's watch and listen to one more animation. When an action potential arrives at the end of an axon, a signal is transmitted across a synapse to a receiving cell. Although synapses may be either chemical or electrical, we will only look at a chemical synapse in detail. How do signals travel across a chemical synapse? There is a narrow gap, the synaptic cleft, between the synaptic terminal of a sending neuron and the surface of a receiving cell. And the action potential arrives at the end of the axon of the sending cell. This causes chemical changes that make vesicles containing a chemical called a neurotransmitter fuse with the plasma membrane. The neurotransmitter molecules spill out into the synaptic cleft, diffuse across, and bind to the receptors on the receiving cell's membrane. The binding of neurotransmitters to receptors causes the attached ion channels to open. Depending on the type of neurotransmitter, receptors, and channels involved, this may excite or inhibit the receiving cell. Here we show excitation. Sodium ions rush in, changing the polarity of the membrane, and an action potential is triggered in the receiving cell. The neurotransmitter is broken down by an enzyme, and the ion channels close. Enzymatic breakdown is one of the several mechanisms by which transmission is terminated at chemical synapses. OK, so I hope that that's clear. Um, we have our active potential reaching the, the synapse and we have the neurotransmitters being released into the synaptic cleft. We have a couple other things I want to look at here in this diagram. Um, I'll draw this in over here, uh, an autoreceptor and over here a reuptake gate. So we're going to look at how uh, some things can modify the system. We see the calcium gates open here uh, to allow the, the vesicles to be released. And we call this the presynaptic side. And of course that makes this the postsynaptic side and I think I may move to a different drawing uh, that will make ourselves we'll talk about the difference between the EPSPs and IPSPs uh, in just a moment so let's look at what else we have to cover um, before we go to that picture uh, let's talk about some specific neurotransmitters these are a handful whoops that's not the right button hold on one second Okay, and we're back. Um, 
Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that we need to know. Acetylcholine is the primary neurotransmitter of the neuromuscular junction. It is the chemical that our motor neurons use to talk to our muscle cells. This is spelled wrong. Let me fix this. There we go. Um, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that we most associate with mood. Uh, we know that antidepressant drugs will boost the levels of serotonin, and we'll talk about how that happens in just a moment. Uh, we won't spend much time on norepinephrine now, but it will show up later in the course. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's uh, in different parts of the brain, does different things, but uh, it'll be important to us in psychology as it applies to uh, schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease, which are both related to levels of dopamine, schizophrenia to too high levels of dopamine, and Parkinson's uh, to dopamine levels being too low. GABA, which is an abbreviation for a very long word, uh, is interesting in that it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And then we have our endorphins, our body's natural painkillers that are released in times of stress. And again, these, most of these neurotransmitters are excitatory, but, some, but GABA, for example, uh, is inhibitory. So those are just a few of the neurotransmitters you should know. Let's next talk about synaptic integration. When we talk about synaptic integration, we need to look at this drawing. Here we have one receiving neuron with multiple inputs, the green, the blue, the black, and the red. And so we have more than one piece of information coming in. And some of these pieces of information coming in are excitatory. There are EPSPs, excitatory postsynaptic potentials. They are going to cause sodium ions to come in and stimulate this neuron, bringing the, um, the potential, the membrane potential, up towards threshold. And here we have another excitatory, uh, an EPSP and an EPSP. And here's an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, or an IPSP. In order for this neuron to fire, the summation of these inputs, uh, these positive stimulating inputs and this negative input, have to be enough to uh, bring the potential, the membrane potential of this neuron uh, to threshold, or negative 55 millivolts. And it is a summation. It could be that these um, signals are coming in physically close together, such that they would sum, or that they're coming in uh, close together in time so that they sum. And of course, this inhibitory one down here would not, would, would subtract from. But this integration shows that this system is not um, just a one-for-one. One. It is an integrative system. Um, uh, we're getting multiple inputs resulting in a singular output. So they have analog down here, meaning multiple inputs, but digital. You're either on or off. You either fire an action potential or you don't, depending on how these um, different inputs integrate. Now, once we've dumped these neurotransmitters into the synapse, here's our drawing. Uh, we have an axial coming down, causing vesicles to release neurotransmitters into the synapse. These neurotransmitters move across the synapse and can plug into receptors on the postsynaptic side. If it's an excitatory neurotransmitters that are doing this, that might open up sodium channels which stimulate this neuron and with enough stimulation and enough sodium coming in to possibly fire its own new action potential. Now once we've done this, we've released a, a large number of these neurotransmitters into the synapse. Let's put some more in there. Um, we have to get rid of them. Now some of them will just diffuse out. You know, just by diffusion we'll, we'll move out of this space. Um, some of them will be broken down by enzymes. So I'm going to use my little, here's my enzyme coming here. That will break some of these down and take them out of there. But some of them are recycled. They're taken back in through what we call a reuptake gate. Uh, and repackaged into vesicles so that we can use them again. So the reuptake gate is something we want to look at real quick. We also have autoreceptors. An autoreceptor is a receptor on the presynaptic side such that if one of these neurotransmitters binds to the autoreceptor, that's basically like a, an off switch telling this releasing neuron that there's enough neurotransmitters in the synapse and we don't need to release any more so we're kind of shutting this system down, blocking this off. Well, that's not really the pin I wanted, but um, you know, saying turn off, stop releasing neurotransmitters. Um, it, it acts as an off switch, that autoreceptor. So again, there are three ways we can get the neurotransmitters out of the synapse after we've used them. They can diffuse out, they can be broken down by an enzyme, and an example of that enzyme 
An example of one of those enzymes is monoamino oxidase, which is a type of, of enzyme we know because it ends in AST that would come in and uh, break down these neurotransmitters. And I mentioned that one specifically because we're going to talk about a drug that can block the action of MAO, monoamino oxidase. Uh, and finally, we can recycle them by taking them back up through the reuptake gate. Now, all of that leads us to a discussion of how do, how can drugs affect the synapse? So coming back to this picture, we could have a drug that is similar in shape to the neurotransmitter. Maybe it's similar enough in shape that it can mimic the neurotransmitter and bind to the receptor, thus replacing the neurotransmitter eff effectively. And there are drugs that can do that. Uh, morphine and the opium, uh, for example, they mimic our body's natural endorphins because they're so similarly shaped molecules, they can actually bind to the pain-killing receptors uh, in our brains. So some drugs can mimic the neurotransmitter. We can also have drugs that block the receptors. Um, if they block the receptors, then it doesn't matter how much signal we're getting. Uh, if, if the neurotransmitters can't plug into the receptors, they're basically, we've turned these neurons off. And so a drug that would be, would be suppressing or depressing the system, as opposed to a, a drug that would be stimulating uh, be, or uh, the system be a stimulant. So we can block or bind to receptors on the postsynaptic side. Uh, think about a drug that might bind to an autoreceptor, thus basically essentially turning off the release mechanism. If it's p bound to the autoreceptor, again, we can be receiving signals, but we're shutting down these vesicles from dropping, whoops, uh, stopping the vesicles from dropping their contents into the, to the synapse. So we could do that. What if a drug could block the autoreceptor so that even though we have enough in here, we're not turning the off switch, and so we're dumping extra neurotransmitters into the synapse when we don't need them. Uh, there are drugs that block reuptake. This is how cocaine works. Cocaine blocks the reuptake gates in the reward centers of our brain, so we have a flood of uh, dopamine in those systems, and since those dopamine aren't being recycled, they stay in the synapse longer and uh, overstimulate uh, that synapse. This is also uh, interestingly enough, exactly how antidepressant drugs work. Antidepressant drugs are uh, the, in a general class of, of molecules called SSRIs. And an SSRI is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and it is a drug that blocks these reuptake gates. So the serotonin that we release stays in the synapse longer uh, thus elevating our mood and uh, essentially boosting the levels of serotonin by blocking it, its reuptake. There's another class of antidepressant drugs uh, called MAOIs. Uh, MAOIs. And MAOIs are monoamino oxidase inhibitors, and these are drugs that inhibit the monoamino oxidase enzyme, so they're blocking the enzymes that would break down the neurotransmitters, again, uh, keeping the neurotransmitters in the synapse for a longer period of time. So the point is, there are a lot of different ways that drugs can affect this system, and this is how psychoactive drugs work. Uh, we did mention in class that uh, alcohol affects the shape of the receptors uh, on the postsynaptic side, so instead of them being this shape, uh, like they're supposed to be, maybe they're shaped more like this, and so the neurotransmitters don't fit as well. And we said, of course, when the alcohol wears off, they go back to their shape. But if we do that uh, over and over and over again, they may lose their ability to return to their proper shape. So that's a recap of how uh, the synapse works. Uh, I'll do a, a brief uh, scroll through of the pictures we looked at so we can remind ourselves. We said that when we reach this gap or the synapse, the synaptic cleft, that the uh, electrical signal has to turn to a chemical signal. These chemicals that are released are shape-specific molecules called neurotransmitters. Uh, they're released because the calcium ions flow in as the active potential reaches the terminus, and that causes the neurotransmitters to be released across the synapse where they bind to receptors on the postsynaptic side. And when they bind to those receptors on the postsynaptic side, they can open up sodium channels or block sodium channels, either being excitatory or EPSPs or inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. We said that those potentials have to integrate, um, so multiple inputs, uh, some to either give us a new active potential or not. Uh, we mentioned uh, the names of some of the more common neurotransmitters and what they do. Uh, we spoke about how the neurotransmitters move out of the synapse and how drugs can affect the synapse. I hope this visually gives you a good uh, review of the synapse uh, so you have what you need to for the test.